Hello, everyone. My name is Jeff Gabello, and I'm a supervising project manager at the FASB, and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar on cash flow information. We put together a presentation that might provide some interesting ideas for your future research. Before we dive into the presentation, there's a link to the materials in the chat so that you can download the PDF of the slides. We're also recording this session, and it will be available for playback for six months after we're done today. However, there will be no CPE credit for today's webinar or the replay. Let's go to slide two. Here you'll find the names and contact info for all of our presenters today. Today's speakers are Michael Minnis, Professor of Accounting and Charles E. Merrill, Faculty Scholar at the University of Chicago, Christine Bodison, FASB Board Member, Richard Gabriel, FASB Assistant Project Manager, Mike Schmeller, FASB Practice Fellow, Michael Yip, FASB Postdoctoral Fellow, and myself, Jeff Cabello. Please feel free to ask questions during the webinar, and please enter them into the Q&A panel. We'll be actively monitoring your questions during the webinar, and we'll get to as many as we can during our time today. I just want to note that the views expressed by all FASB presenters today are our own. Official positions of the FASB are reached only after extensive due process and deliberations. Next slide, please. So on this slide, we we're outlining our overall objectives of the webinar, and we'll provide a high-level overview of the topics we'll be covering. The objective of today's webinar is to offer historical perspective on the statement of cash flows, including both prior and current standard setting efforts. Additionally, we'll provide an overview of stakeholder feedback received on the perceived challenges in this area and potential topics for further academic research. Regarding today's agenda, we'll begin by sharing information about the Emerging Financial Reporting Issues, Issue Research Symposium, which is the focal point bringing us together today. Following that, we'll provide a summary of historical standards related to the statement of cash flows. We'll also delve into other standard setting activities that the FASB has embarked on. Subsequently, we will present stakeholder feedback on the, to on the topic, including discussions on the 2016 and 2021 agenda consultations. Additionally, we'll have a look at the current projects on the FASB agenda and provide a quick update on international activities. Towards the end, we'll discuss academic research that could help shape these potential projects. Finally, we'll reserve time at the end for any questions that we may not have addressed during the webinar. With that, I'll hand it over to Mike Minnis to delve into the details about the symposium. All right, thank you, Jeff. If we could go to the next slide here. Uh, the Emerging Financial Reporting Issues Research Symposium is a one-day research symposium that the FASB is jointly sponsoring with the Chukasian Accounting Research Center uh, of the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. Uh, and it will be hosted at FASB's headquarters in Norwalk, Connecticut. The purpose of this symposium is to help encourage and support research relevant to financial reporting issues that are in the early stage of standard setting. Our first symposium will be hosted April 4th, 2024, which is focused on intangibles. And our next symposium in 20, <clears throat> excuse me, in 2025 will focus on cash flow information. The symposium will feature academic research and panel discussions, including different user view viewpoints. And uh, uh, it's great to announce also that the FASB and the, the Chukasian uh, Accounting Research Center have agreed to co-sponsor symposium in 2024, 25, and 26. Uh, so also look forward to what the topic will be in 2026 as well. So very excited to uh, to uh, get this, uh, our first one under our belts in 2024, and talk to you about the statement of cash flows uh, today in prep for the 2025 session. Let me hand it over to Christine now to talk about our, our call for papers. Christine. Thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, so we have um, already issued our call for papers for the 2025 symposium. And um, in that call for papers, we describe the type of research that we're looking for, but broadly we're looking for research that will help us to understand the um, usefulness of cash flow information and um, any costs associated with preparing that information, consuming that information. So just broadly, uh, the four bullet points that appear on a call for paper um, uh, on our website is in uh, research that looks at the decision usefulness of cash flow information, including uh, key performance indicators related to cash flows, the benefits and costs of alternative presentation approaches for the statement of cash flows, the benefits and costs of disaggregated cash flow information, and the decision usefulness of the structure of the statement of cash flows, not only the current structure, but alternative structures that we might consider. 
So if you're inf interested in more information um, about the 2025 symposium, we do have a tab on our academic landing page, which uh, provides additional information, including a link to the call for papers. And the um, portal for submitting papers is already open, although the paper submission deadline is not until November 15th of this year. And that is why we're doing the webinar today, early on, because we're hoping that this webinar will provide some food for thought, some stimulate some creative ideas for research, and hopefully provide some time so that if you aren't already working on a project, um, you can begin working on a project and share it with us uh, and allow us to consider it for the symposium by submitting uh, by November 15, 2024. Um, there is a $75 submission fee that is required for each paper that is submitted. And with that, I will turn things over to Michael Yep. All right, thanks, Christine. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here with you. So in the next part, I'll cover the present guidance on cash flow before getting to the history of cash flows, recent ASUs, and industry-specific standards. Uh, next slide, please. So you can find guidance related to the statement of cash flows in topic 230 of the codification, which applies to businesses and not-for-profit entities. It describes three different classifications of cash, cash flows, methods for reporting cash flow statements, and the disclosure of non-cash investing and financing activities. Under this guidance, entities are required to classify cash flows in three different categories, financing, investing, and operating activities. Finance activities pertain to amounts obtained and dispersed to owners and creditors. Investing activities relate to cash inflows and outflows related to the acquisition and disposal of debt and equity instruments, and assets used in the production of goods and services by the entity. And finally, operating cash flows is a residual category, which includes inflows and outflows related to events that are not classified as investing or financing activities. For example, inflows and outflows related to the production and delivery of goods and services as well as interest and income expenses would be classified as operating activities. Additionally, Topic 230 allows entities to present their statement of cash flows using either the indirect or the direct method. The indirect method starts with net income and adds back non-cash charges such as depreciation and amortization, as well as changes in current assets and current liabilities, which should reconcile back with the net cash flows from operating activities. On the other hand, the direct method starts with presenting gross cash receipts and payments from items such as cash received from customers, cash paid to suppliers and employees, interest received and paid, and income taxes paid to provide net cash flows from operating activities. In addition, Topic 230 stipulates that if the indirect method is used, the entity shall also disclose cash paid for interest and income taxes. So regardless of whether the indirect or the direct method is used, all non-cash investing and financing activities shall be disclosed in either a narrative form or as in a summary schedule. If a direct method is prepared, all entities, except for not-for-profit entities, must also present the indirect reconciliation of operating cash flows back to net income. So if we can move to the next slide, please. So why do we need the statement of cash flow? Well, the primary objective of the statement of cash flows is to provide relevant information about the cash receipts and payments of an entity, which investors and creditors can use to assess the entity's ability to generate future cash flows, capacity to pay dividends, and need for external financing. The statement of cash flow also provides additional information for stakeholders on how to reconcile net income back to operating cash flows and non-cash investing and financing activities. So if we move to the next slide, so now that I covered some of the present guidance, let's get into some of the history of cash flow, which goes back at least 60 years. The earliest effort on the statement of cash flow was back in 1963 when the accounting principal board acknowledged increased attention on the flow fund analysis and issued opinion three on the fund statement. At the time, funds were defined as all financial resources arising from transactions with external parties. In opinion three, the board stated that a statement of source and application of funds should be presented as supplementary information in financial reports. However, the inclusion of such information was not mandatory. ABB Opinion 19, reporting changes in financial position issued in March 1971, superseded Opinion 3. In the first paragraph of the opinion, the board acknowledged the significant increase in the number of companies presenting the fund statement, as well as support of Opinion 3 by principal stock exchanges. The board chose to give the statement a new name, Statement of Changes in Financial Position. Similar to opinion three, the board recommended, but did not require the statement of changes in financial position. 
Now, if we fast forward to 1987, FAS 95 was issued and established the framework and requirements for cash flow reporting that we have today, which is now codified in Topic 230, which supersedes ABB Opinion 19. FAS 95 notably discussed the board's deliberation of the scope related to financial institutions, investment companies, small businesses, and not-for-profit entities related to the cash flow statement. The basis for conclusion uh, section within FAS 95 noted that respondents from financial institutions, particularly commercial banks, generally said that the statement of cash flow proposed in FAS is useful for their industry. Respondents noted that banks primarily made money from lending activities and cash is the product of banks' earnings activities. However, ultimately the board concluded that the differences between the activities of banks and other businesses did not justify excluding banks from the requirements to produce a cash flow statement. The board recognized that while the nature of a bank's business is different from non-financial institutions, banks still need the same uh, reasons for cash as manufacturers and other businesses. Some of these activities that the board cited include investing in operations, paying obligations, and providing return to investors. In recent years, county standard updates such as 2012-05, 2016, 14, 15, and 18 have provided guidance for certain entries and transactions related to the classification and presentation of the statement of cash flow. Some of these changes were related to, for example, donated financial assets, not-for-profit presentation, and restricted cash. So now that I'm done with today's history lesson, let's get into some of the subsequent amendments to, to the present guidance in topic 230. So if we go to the next slide. So first, I'd like to discuss uh, ASU 201205, which addresses the diversity in practice surrounding the treatment of cash flows from the sale of donated financial assets. Under this ASU, if donated financial assets are provided without any not-for-profit imposed restrictions or limitations and converted nearly immediately to cash, that cash flow would be considered as operating activities. If there are uh, not-for-profit restrictions or limitations on the use of contributed resources for long-term purposes, those cash receipts would be classified as finance activities. Otherwise, cash receipts from the sale of donated financial assets should be classified as investing activities. Next, we have ASU 2016-14, which amends the reporting for not-for-profit entities. Principally, if a not-for-profit entity uses the direct method, it would not be required to present or disclose the indirect method reconciliation of cash flow from operating activities back to net income. Can we move to the next slide, please? So the next one is ASU 2016-15, which addresses the diversity in practice surrounding the classification of certain cash receipts and payments. There are eight specific areas that this ASU addresses. First, under this ASU, debt prepayment or extinguishment extinguishment costs related to uh, cash flows would be treated as financing activities. Second, uh, for the settlement of zero coupon debt instruments or instruments with insignificant coupon rates, the portion of the cash payable attributable to the accredited interest related to the debt discount classified as operating activities, and the portion attributable to the principal amount would be classified as a cash outflow for finance activities. Third, for the contingent consideration made after a business combination, the payment related to the liability between the financing and operating activities should be bifurcated. Cash payments made up to the amount of the contingent consideration liability are recognized at the acquisition date as financing activities, and any excess would be treated as operating activities. Cash payments made soon after the acquisition would be classified as cash outflows for investing activities. The fourth one was cash proceeds from the, from the settlement of insurance claims that should be classified based on the nature of loss. Fifth, there was the proceeds from the settlement of corporate-owned life insurance policies, including bank-owned life insurance policies, which should be classified as cash inflows from investing activities. The cash payments for premiums, on the other hand, for corporate-owned policies may be classified as cash outflows as either or as a combination of investing and operating activities. Sixth relates to the distribution received from equity method investees. When applying the equity method, a policy election should be made on to classify distributions distributions received either through the cumulative earnings approach or the nature of distribution approach. Under the cumulative earnings approach, distributions are classified as operating activities unless they exceed the cumulative equity and earnings under which it should be classified as an inflow from investing activities. Under the nature of distribution approach, distributions are either classified as return of investments or return on investments. and should be classified respectively under the operating and investing sections. Seventh, relates to the beneficial interest in securitization transactions. This change requires that the transfer's beneficial interest to be recognized as a non-cash activity and the related cash receipts from payments and securitized trade receivables to be classified as cash inflows from investing activities. Eighth and finally, 
Another change was made regarding separately identifiable cash flows in the application of the predominance principle. This ASU stipulates that cash receipts and payments that have, been, have multiple aspects and relate to more than one class of cash flow should be first determined by specific gap guidance. In the absence of specific gap guidance, firms should separately identify the sources and uses with those cash receipts and payments and classify each separately identified source or use within the three categories of cash flows. If the sources and uses cannot be separated, the classification should be based on the predominant source or use of those cash flows. All right, so next I'll discuss ASU 2016-18, which addresses the diversity in classification and presentation related to restricted cash on the cash flow statement. This update requires that the statement of cash flow explain changes in restricted cash and cash equivalents. These amounts should be included in the cash and cash, cash, cash equivalents when you're reconciling the beginning and end of period totals shown on the statement of cash flows. And finally, ASU 2023-08 deals with crypto assets that are received as non-cash consideration in the ordinary course of business and converted nearly immediately to cash. Those cash proceeds should be classified as operating activities. Similarly, when crypto assets are received by a not-for-profit entity without donor-imposed limitations for sale that are converted nearly immediately into cash, those cash proceeds should be classified as operating cash flows. If the crypto assets were donated with donor-imposed limitations for long-term purposes, those cash proceeds would be then classified as a financing activity. So we move to the next slide, please. So uh, I'll finally cover industry-specific guidance. So currently, there's relatively limited industry-specific guidance for the statement of cash flows. And for the most part, uh, the cash flow statement is consistent and uniform across different industries. However, I'd like to highlight just a few differences across industries. So if you look at the top left, Topic 920 provides industry guidance for bro the broadcasting industry, particularly related to the rights obtained for program materials under license agreements. So under this guidance, broadcaster license these cash paid to obtain rights for program materials under a license agreement are classified as an operating activity. In the reconciliation of net income to net cash flow from operating activities, the amortization of capitalized costs of license agreements for program materials is to be included as an adjustment. So to the right of that is topic 926, which provides industry guidance for the film industry. Under topic 926, cash flows for film, participation, exploitation, and manufacturing costs are classified as operating cash flows. And the amortization of film costs should be included in the reconciliation of net income to net cash flows from operating activities. To its right, we have topic 942, which deals with banks, savings institutions, and credit unions, and specifies that they are not required to report gross amounts of cash receipts or cash payments for deposits placed with other financial institutions and withdraw those deposits. So if we move to the bottom left, we have topic 958, which applies to not-for-profit entities and relates to the cash received with donor restrictions, which I discussed earlier. Uh, topic 946 deals with investment companies and does not require those entities to prepare a statement of cash flows with certain exceptions though. Uh, topic 970 deals with the flexibility to real estate industry for certain types of productive assets that may be considered inventory for certain circumstances. So there are some circumstances where real estate entities will acquire Acquire certain land or certain assets that are to be subdivided, improved, and resold on in individual lots. So those would be classified as an operating cash flow given that they have similar characteristics to inventory. And finally, topic 978 provides guidance related time sharing activities within the real estate sector. Changes in time sharing notes receivables, including the sale notes, should be reported as operating activities. So that covers the industry specific guidance. I'll now pass it off to Richard Gabriel. Thank you, Michael. So now we are going to highlight some key stakeholders feedback that the staff and the board have received over the years. And I will start with the two agenda consultations that we have recently undertaken. Next slide, please. So in 2016, the FASB issued an invitation to comment to solicit feedbacks about potential financial accounting and the reporting topics that the board should consider adding to its agenda. Chapter four of the ITC included reporting performance and cash flows. The purpose of this agenda consultation was to solicit broad stakeholders' feedbacks about the future standard setting agenda of the FASB to ensure that the FASB continues to allocate its finite resources to achievable standard setting projects that fulfill its primary mission of improving financial accounting and reporting standards and addressing topics that are of the highest priority to its stakeholders. Next slide, please. 
In common letter responses, many stakeholders supported making improvements to the statement of cash flows. However, views differed on the types of improvement the board should undertake. Some respondents, including practitioners and the financial statement users, recommend that the board reconsider three category structure of the statements. Those with this view suggest that the structure of statements should involve two categories, for example, operating versus non-operating, or four categories, for example, by adding a residual category in addition to the operating, investing, and the financing categories. Most of these respondents also comment that the board should align the structure of the cash flow statements to the income statement or balance sheet. The board held meetings in February and May 2017 to discuss the stakeholders' feedback received and the potential pass forward. Next slide, please. So the board at the time in general noted that the statement of cash flows currently has appropriate categories and the standard setting activities should focus on challenging issues and the judgments related to the classification of certain types of transactions leading to diversity in practice. Certain board members expressed support for revisiting the cash flow statements to align with income statements and the balance sheet, that is to make the statement of cash flows resemble of a cash basis income statement. The board at the time has also undertaken more targeted projects, such as EITF projects that lead to the issuance of the ASU 2016-15, classification of certain cash receipts and cash payments, and the ASU 2016-18 restricted cash that Michael discussed on a previous slide. So at the end, the board decided to consider other projects based on the stakeholders' feedback received under the 2016 ITC. Next slide, please. So in June 2021, the board issued another invitation to comment to solicit board stakeholders' feedback about its future standard setting agenda. Chapter 1 of the 2021 ITC, Disaggregation of Financial Reporting Information, noted that investors and other financial statement users cite a general need for greater disaggregation and granularity of a range of financial reporting information. Overall, the board received over 70 responses that addressed the 2021 ITC broadly, of which the responses from users, practitioners, and the preparers constitute over three quarters of all common letters received. Next slide, please. So overall, investors and other financial statement users generally agree that greater disaggregation of the statement of cash flows should be a priority for the board to help them better perform their analysis, Preparers caution that the board should conduct a thorough and a transparent cost benefits analysis in the area because they receive minimal questions on the cash flow statements and therefore assert that their investor already received sufficient information. And about half of the investors that respond broadly to the 2021 ITC provide feedbacks on the decision usefulness of the information present in a statement of cash flows prepared using the indirect method. Overall, investors support a need for both greater disaggregation and the transparency of a company's cash flow to better understand and analyze a company's operating results. Most investors did not express significant concerns about the direct, direct method, but placed an emphasis on certain supplemental disclosures, such as cash collect from customers, cash interest paid by debt refinancing, financing fees, non-debt related interest, and tax paid related to gains on the same of cash flows. So there's also a request for greater consistency of the presentation of non-cash add-back items and the deductions on the face of the cash flow statement. A majority of preparers note that potential complexity and associated costs with requiring the direct method. Overall, companies with complex operations and structures will see increased costs associated with the presentation of the statement of cash flows prepared using the direct method. Some financial institution prepares support the board continuing to provide additional flexibility in how the information in the statement of cash flow is presented because costs of altering the current system, processes, and the controls for requiring the direct method will be significant. A few preparers and trade groups provide feedbacks on cash flow information requests received from analysts. They stated that additional detail requests by analysts are minimal and that the frequency of those increase is relevant, relatively slow. Uh, some of the past requests relate to the key drivers of the variability across period, such as accounts receivable fluctuations, working capital changes, and the non-recurring items, or clarification of the nature and the definition of certain cash flows or non-cash flow activities, the purchase and sales of certain assets, and the intended use of cash by management. Next slide, please. 
So as a result of that feedback, the FASB chair added a project to the research agenda in June 2022 to explore potential improvements to the statement of cash flows. The staff began its research and outreach to help understand the level of support for certain potential solutions. Be because of the historical challenges with cash flow improvements, we start a research project to ensure that we have feasible paths forward before adding it to the technical agenda. One of the main difference uh, between a research project and other technical project is that a research project needs to work towards a package that meets the agenda criteria, which are a pervasive need, an identified scope, and a feasible solution. So part of that research is to explore ideas that could fit into that package. Next slide, please. So next, I would like to highlight some comments received from our stakeholders group since the project was added to the research agenda in 2022. Uh, some users explicitly state that the cash flow statement is critical to their analysis or more important than the income statements and the balance sheet. They mentioned that the cash flow statements provide a more realistic pictures of economic condition of a business because it is not adjusted for items that management deem non-recurring. Many users note a heavy emphasis on deriving free cash flow from the statement of cash flows for business valuations, assessing earnings quality and growth potential, and projecting future capital decisions. Most users comment that the statement of cash flows provide information they need to analyze change in current assets and current liability for companies they cover. However, Many of them would like to have better connectivities between the changes in the balance sheet and the amounts in the statement of cash flow. And just to give a little more background about the working capital reconciliations, the change in the balance sheet line item year to year may not match the change in the line item in the statement of cash flows. Some reasons include foreign currency impact and, and the business combinations. A reconciliation could help investors gain insight into why those amounts differ. For example, Working capital reconciliations for revenue-related accounts, such as accounts receivables, contra assets, and contra liabilities, would help users better understand how change in balance sheet uh, reflect in the cash flow movement. Users have requested more information about cash received from customers, in other words, cash basis revenue. Uh, changes in payments or receipts are important to users' decision-making, and such direct method-like disclosures are straightforward and intuitive. For example, users who follow telecommunication industries comment that topic 606, revenue from contract with customers, create additional difference between cash revenue and gap revenue, and they will prefer to see cash from customer as a leading indicator to help determine revenue trends over time. Other users note that cash received from customer is less susceptible to manipulation than amount disclosed in the income statement, and the cash amount received will provide greater insight into stability of cash inflows and an entity's long-term prospects. Some financial institution users noted that a cash interest received disclosure will be helpful because the difference between interest income and cash interest received could be material for financial institutions, and such disclosure would help them distinguish between cash and non-cash interest income. Some stakeholders comment that either requiring the use of direct method of disclosure that provides information consistent with what is provided under the direct method will result in a greater cost to preparers. Other stakeholders note that many investors have adapted their analysis to accommodate that the indirect method of the cash flow statements given the prevalence in the marketplace. And therefore, requiring the use of direct methods for preparers could be a challenging change for investors. And we also learned that some uh, stakeholders suggest further disaggregation of disclosures. For example, cash flow line items with the label other should be further disaggregated in a footnotes disclosure if the amounts are above a certain threshold. Additional disaggregation around the changing working capital amounts and the note that ensuring those line items match the balance sheet would provide more decision useful information. Disclosure of certain cash outflow, such as depreciation and amortization of financial versus non-financial assets, cash compensations, capital expenditures between those related to fixed assets versus, versus maintenance, cash spend related to software and other technology. Some stakeholders suggest reorganizing the statement of cash flows to allow users to determine matrix such as EBITDA and free cash flow directly from the statement of cash flows. And some stakeholders note that the cash flow statements continue to have very limited relevance for financial institutions. And they suggest that the board could revise the classification 
for certain transactions specific to financial institutions. And lastly, stakeholders also provide a variety of ad hoc suggestions about the cash flow classification of certain transactions. For example, the classification of share-based payments was raised. Uh, share-based payments are pre presented as a non-cash addback in the statement of cash flows in the operating section. However, some investors maintain that share-based compensation is a financing activity that should be presented in the financing sections. Uh, this is because the entity is repurchasing its own shares to make those share-based awards. While those share repurchase are reflect in the financing, that is at a time the share are actually repurchased, and therefore not at the same time as the non-cash stock based comp ad back is made. Uh, next slide, please. So in December 2023, the SEC Chief Accountant Paul Munter released a statement addressing the importance of the statement of cash flow to providing investors with high quality financial information. Mr. Munter points out that the statement of cash flow has consistently been a leading area of restatements. Accordingly, he reminds the preparers and auditors of their professional responsibilities related to the statement of cash flows. I would like to highlight his comments on how to improve cash flow information for investors. First, issuers should carefully consider how to best present cash and non-cash information and whether additional information should be disclosed to facilitate an investor's understanding of the statement of cash flow and the financial statement as a whole. For example, Issuers could further disaggregate amounts currently reported in the income uh, statement of cash flow, disclose additional information to better enable investors to understand the relationship between the amount reported in the income statement and the statement of cash flow, and consider reporting operating cash flow under the direct method. Issuers should consider whether their ability to collect information about gross operating cash receipts and the payments has been improved by advanced in technology. Issuers that continue to report cash flow using the indirect method could supplement such cash flow information with disclosure of specific major class of gross cash receipt and payments, such as cash collect from customers, cash paid to employees, and cash paid to suppliers. Third, investor, preparers, auditors, and other stakeholders should consider engaging with standard setters whenever a standard setting project could result in cash flow implications. It is critically important for the stakeholders to provide constructive feedbacks for the fast fee project on the statement of cash flows. Such stakeholders' observation could include continued feedbacks on the benefits and costs related to application of direct method, and specific detailed suggestions that could help FASB identify any timely and cost-effective solutions that would further enhance the decision usefulness of the same cash flow. So with that, I will turn it over to Mike Shimola to discuss technical agenda and the uh, international activities. Mike? Uh, no, well, well, Richard, once, uh, just before we, we go to Mike, uh, I just wanted to uh, encourage everyone to ask questions. If they have questions, we haven't received any so far, but we do appreciate your questions. Maybe this section was a bit more of background in nature, but now we're going to be moving into the technical projects and the request for research. So, uh, yeah, please submit your questions in the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for your um, turning right to the next slide, um, as Richard mentioned in the feedback on the 2021 IPC and other feedback received over the last few years, users have consistently mentioned a need for greater disaggregation and granularity in financial reporting information, including the statement of cash flows. And based on this feedback, a project related to the statement of cash flows was added to FASB's research agenda in June of 2022. At its November 8, 2023 meeting, the board decided to add a project to its technical agenda to make targeted improvements to the statement of cash flows to provide investors with more decision useful information. The board decided that the scope of this project is to, one, reorganize and disaggregate the statement of cash flows for financial institutions, and two, develop a disclosure about an entity's cash interest received. Now, under proposed improvement one, the statement of cash flows would be revived to expand the operating cash flow section to include additional items that are considered core to the operations of a financial institution. Additionally, the operating section would include a subtotal for net interest income related adjustments to net income to arrive at cash flows from operations. Several financial institution preparers and investors maintain that many of the activities 
that are currently classified as investing or financing are viewed as operating activities for financial institutions, such as accepting deposits and making loans. When conducting stakeholder outreach prior to this project getting added to the technical data, outreach participants asserted the current state of the statement of cash flow for financial institutions is not decision useful. Although there was mixed feedback, some investors the staff spoke with indicated that a rearranged statement of cash flows would do a better job of depicting true operations of a bank. In the staff's preliminary work and initial outreach on proposed improvement one, the term financial institution was used broadly. The staff will now explore various approaches to determine the entity's in scope, including whether industry-specific guidance could be amended or criteria could be developed. The staff will explore revised definitions of investing and financing activities for the entity's in scope. Proposed improvement two is a disclosure of cash interest received. This improvement would require disclosure on the face of the cash flow statement, similar to the disclosure currently required for cash interest paid. Broadly, this would be a new single number disclosure presented at the bottom of the cash flow statement. During the staff's initial stakeholder outreach, a majority of investors supported this disclosure, and some observed that a proposed disclosure may encourage investors to frequently utilize the cash flow statement in their analyses. Most investors, the cash, most investors emphasize that cash interest received would be an important disclosure and that it would be useful to see the amounts of cash interest received versus accrued and accreted interest. Investors noted this would be particularly useful for financial assets rather than business combination because investors would like to understand the interest that come from non-cash accretion versus actual cash interest received. The staff will perform research and outreach to determine if the scope of the disclosure should be for financial institutions or if a broader scope of entity should be included. In terms of next steps, the staff is currently developing models for both improvements and will be performing research and outreach to stakeholders in the coming months. In addition to the technical agenda project, the FASB chair also retained a project about the statement of cash flows on the research agenda to further explore additional potential improvements to the statement of cash flows to provide decision useful information for investors and other allocators of capital. Flipping to the next slide, in addition to what's being done at the FASB, other standard centers across the world are also exploring projects related to the statement of cash flows due to feedback and outreach from investors, suggesting that changes to the statement of cash flows could provide additional decision useful information. The International Accounting Standards Board, or IASB, is currently proposing changes to the financial statement presentation and disclosure requirements as part of its primary financial statements project with a focus on the statement of profit or loss. The IASB undertook this project in response to investors' concerns about the comparability and transparency of companies' performance reporting. In 2019, the IASB issued an exposure draft on this project to be deliberated from 2021 to 2023. The final standard is expected to be issued in the first half of this year. As I mentioned, the main focus of the upcoming standard is the statement of profit or loss which will be segregated into operating, investing, and financing activities. Additionally, income statements of certain entity types will have special presentation requirements, notably entities for which investing and providing financing to customers is a main business activity, such as financial institutions. The new IFRS accounting standard will also include minor changes to the statement of cash flows to comparability by specifying a consistent starting point for the indirect method for operating cash flows and eliminating options for the classification of interest and dividends. Additionally, the ISB's project looks to find operating profit as a residual category. Similar to the FASB, the ISB utilizes stakeholder input on its standard setting activities and work plan. In 2021, the ISB published a request for information. An appendix of the request had some frequently suggested financial reporting issues. Undertaking a project to amend or place IAS 7 statement of cash flows was discussed as a potential project for the IASB. The FASB staff notes that many of the issues noted in the IASB's request for information are consistent with the items noted by stakeholders in the FASB 2021 ITC, including difficulties in reconciling the statement of cash flows to other primary financial statements, a need for greater disaggregation of certain items in the statement of cash flows, and desire for a statement of cash flow specifically for financial institutions. The IASB decided to add a project on the statement of cash flows and related matters 
to its research pipeline, but has not yet added the project to its work plan. FASB staff will continue to monitor international activities throughout the duration and statement of cash flows, technical and research agenda projects. With that, I'll turn it over to Michael Yip uh, to discuss the projects and academic research. Uh, just uh, excuse me before we go to Michael Yip. I just wanted to apologize for the uh, audio issues. We are trying to work on that and trying to resolve them. We do apologize, but yes, we are we are we are aware of them when we are trying to resolve them. And now, now, uh, if we can go to Michael Yip. Sure. Uh, thanks, Mike, and uh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, so, if we can just move to the next slide, please. Okay, so on this slide, we've included several potential research questions that would be helpful for our research agenda project. And I promise you that I'm not holding back any all the good ones. Um, but to be honest, you'll have to attend next year to see um, uh, all the research questions that are addressed. So first, research on additional line item disaggregation, for example, on of depreciation and am amortization, and whether it would provide more decision useful information to investors, including the comparability of more or less disaggregated cash flow statements. If we could get uh, potentially descriptive statistics on the average disaggregation by category. What are the most common categories? And does the number of adjustments vary by industry or other type of cross-section? Does the greater alignment between line items on the balance sheet item or balance sheet statement, as well as the statement of cash flow, provide more decision useful information? For example, does the change in balance sheet uh, relate to, for example, accounts receivable align with the cash flow statement? And would that provide more decision useful information? Another research question that might be of interest is, is the statement of cash flow relied on by investors for more information about cash usage or information about non-cash adjustments? Is one aspect more useful uh, to the other or to investors than the other? For example, are non-cash adjustments related to stock-based compensation and depreciation more useful? Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, what types of non-GAAP adjustments and KPIs are provided outside the financial statements, such as uh, free cash flow or other industry-specific metrics? Would a free cash flow subtotal be helpful, or would a, a standardized subtotal be useful? How do investors consider errors resulting from the restatement in the cash flow statement versus other errors in other financial statements? Do preparers evaluate materiality different when considering cash flow statements versus other statements? If so, why, and what are the differences? For example, uh, as Richard had mentioned earlier, there seems to be a different bar for the statement of cash flow versus the income statement and other statements. Uh, another question is how is materiality applied on errors on the cash flow statement versus the balance sheet and income statement item? What are the benefits and costs of alternative presentation approaches uh, for the statement of cash flow? Uh, for example, the direct or indirect presentation of cash flow from operating activities. Are there incremental costs associated with preparing under the direct method? For example, are there greater one-time or are these ongoing costs? And also have changes in technology reduced the cost of preparing a direct method? Uh, in terms of indirect method, are there supplemental disclosures? For example, cash received from customers or other direct method supplemental disclosures that would be useful? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so how do investors use information conveyed by the current operating investing and financing structure of the cash flow statement? Are there other potential structures that could provide enhanced information? How does the disclosure treatment of non-cash transactions impact the decision usefulness of information provided by the cash flow statement? And finally, does the decision usefulness of the cash flow statement vary by industry, by investor type, or other types of uh, cross-sectional analysis? While these are just several questions that have been posed and that would be helpful for the standard setting process, it is no by no means an exhaustive list, and we'll consider other cash flow research questions for this symposium. So for the next portion of the um, presentation, we're going to open up to the audience for any questions. So I highly recommend if you do have any questions, type it in the chat box and we'll uh, respond to each one in the order that they're posed. Thank you, Michael. So yes, thank you for it. We have received a few questions um, and uh, we will be um, taking these now. Uh, Richard, do you want to try the first question? Sure. Yeah. So uh, we got a question on the free cash flow. Uh, it somehow disappeared. I could read it to you. Let's see. Um, let me see if I could. Uh, 
Actually, I don't see it either. Yeah, it, it just but it was basically a question about free cash flow and why is it important to users and what is it that they're not getting so, out of the financial statements today. So, so for all the uh, uh, stakeholders we talked to, about at least half of them mentioned how important the free cash flow is to them uh, for their analysis. Like they really need those information for mainly for the business out, uh, valuations. And uh, so they would like us to kind of standardize the free cash flow just because of the level of disaggregation. Uh, sometimes it's hard for, uh, for users to calculate that number. And I just want to uh, remind everybody that we do have a research project on the uh, on the KPI that could potentially explore the avenue. Yeah, Richard, if I I might just add just a quick comment to that. I mean, I just got done teaching my financial statement analysis class, and obviously, I mean, when we do this, we're calculating free cash flows, which is a number that's not ever reported directly on on the statement of cash flows or in the financial statements anywhere, and we have to do some reconciling. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of information on the, between the income statement, balance sheet, and statement of cash flows to help us do that, but it's often not completely direct and easy to do so. So I think one of the things that uh, oftentimes we, we have to talk to our finance colleagues that things like EBIT, EBITDA, free cash flows are terms that investors often use, but you can't typically go directly find those things directly in the set of financial statements. And how can the, the, the statement of cash flows potentially be restructured to help investors have a way to go see those things on the on the financial statement? So I think that's part of the the you know I think things like cash flow from operations is oftentimes not a term that investors use in part because it's this is also relates to another question here about aligning the statement of cash flows with other financial statements. Well, for example, interest expenses included in in the operating section, and that's not an operating item. And so that's one of the things that uh, can can uh, be potentially uh, problematic uh, when you think about that. So that's just a couple of quick thoughts that I had on that. Great, I think I'm uh, up for uh, taking the next question. So that question is, is there a project to shift the statement of cash flows to be the direct method only, as this is decision useful for investors and more understandable? Um, so presently, there is not a project on our technical agenda to consider the format of the statement of cash flows. That is something that the board will need to discuss um, as part of the research project and uh, what the scope of that research project might be um, uh, if we do at some point vote to um, convert that research project into a technical agenda project. And so all of the research that um, we're uh, looking uh, for on cash flows, of course, is going to inform the board and thinking about what are the primary issues that, that we might need to consider and um, help us to figure out what the scope of, of any future project on the cash flow statement would be. So specifically with respect to the format, direct versus indirect method, uh, we've heard a lot of um, um, disparate uh, opinions from investors with respect to direct versus indirect. Some uh, users argue that the indirect method is providing them with the information they need. Others prefer the direct method. Uh, we certainly get a lot of input from preparers about concerns related to cost. So I think that um, from a research perspective, any uh, evidence that can be provided uh, about how the information is used, what sorts of formats are, are um, uh, more decision useful and why, um, the cost of preparing the information, all of that would help us down the road when we get to the point of deciding whether we're going to do uh, take on a broader project on the uh, cash flow statement and what the parameters of that project would be. So with that, I will turn it over to the individual who is on our team that's going to address the next question. Thank you, Christine. Yes, we're going to look at the um, the question about, there was a question about um, 
ca uh, capex versus maintenance versus um, investment. And uh, so the question is, how do we, you know, how do we feel? That, what is the question basically that that users want? Are they able to, you know, are, are preparers basically able to separate the, out those amounts? And I think that's always been the concern over the years. So this is something we've heard from users that they don't really get. They just they don't get in the investing section sort of a full picture of what is maintenance versus actual investment in capa and like PP&E, for example. And so investors have asked us to consider a disclosure, uh, have mentioned whether we can sort of separate that out. However, I think that's where the challenge lies is what, you know, I think that there could be a lot of judgment and it could be, uh, it might be a challenge to standard set around, you know, defining maintenance and defining, you know, what is actual investment. I think we're, we've seen that in other projects and other standard setting. And I think that's why it's been challenging over the years. And it's something that the staff would have to perform further research on as we move forward. So I think we're going to Mike next. Is, Mike, is uh, my audio a bit better? No. If your video's still bad, then I could take the question. Can, can you hear me? It's still, you're still cutting in and out. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll take the one on alignment then. Sorry, Mike. Uh, so the, the question is, can you expand on aligning the SOCF with the other financial statements? What are the some areas of disalignment currently? So this is, it's a, it's an interesting question. I think it's something that users struggle with, um, investors struggle with. For example, let's say the change in accounts receivable on, you know, if you take the end of, you know, last year and the end of in your year and this year, the difference might be, let's say, 100,000, 100 million, whatever it is, there's the end, but that difference is not the same as the non-cash or the change in the accounts receivable balance shown on the statement of cash flows. And it, it's very confusing for users. They don't really understand why. Uh, but what we've learned is that, you know, there are some basic reasons why they're different. For example, if there's a business combination, that part related to accounts receivable is shown in investing activities, for example, or FX is shown in a different section. So the amounts just don't tie because of the rules and the mechanics. Uh, however, um, we know that preparers fully know the reason for those differences and you know that because they have to reconcile that when they're preparing the statement of cash flows so this has been a question whether we should provide that recon or provide some sort of reconciliation that provides that better connectivity between the changes and the balances because it's not fully transparent to to investors so i can um take the question on uh, cost benefit um so the question is um, what are the criteria for deciding whether the incremental cost benefit change changes on the proposed changes to the cash flow statements produce more efficient markets and better investment decision making? So when it comes to considering the cost um, of the change, there we're looking at um, auditability, um, the extent of changes that would need to be made in systems, um, the, just the overall cost of preparing the information, and then also the cost to investors of revising how they go about analyzing the information that is uh, being produced by the by the cash flow statement. And then on the benefits, we're interested in whether the um, you know whether changes to the cash flow statement, whatever they might be, uh, results in more decision useful information that help investors to arrive at uh, better um, investment decisions. And, um, you know, there's a variety of ways that uh, academics have looked at that issue with respect to, you know, whether forecasts are improved or um, whether resource allocation decisions are improved in, in various ways. Uh, so I think the next question um, is one on, um, what's the next question I, we're going to take, Jeff? I think I was going to take a stab at it, Christine. Yes. Sure, go for um, it, Mike. It says, how does the company's free cash flow compare to its net income? And what does this comparison indicate about the company's financial health and ability to generate uh, cash for future growth and investment? And I'll take this because I just got done beating it in my students' heads for the last nine weeks. Uh, free cash flows equals uh, net income minus reinvestment uh, and plus non-cash items. So when we reconcile, we get to investors get to free cash flows that they'd put in their kind of intrinsic value DCF model. They can reconcile net income, net income, add back non-cash items, subtract reinvestment in the firm. And those are things like reinvestment and working capital, like receivables, payables, inventory, and subtract off the CapEx. So that gets us to, to free cash flow to equity. 
um, uh, in the in the firm. So um, that's the difference between the two. Now, how that indicates future ability to to generate cash flows is that's that's in that's in the qualitative analysis of your understanding of the firm, I think. But that that essentially is how we're reconciling net income to free cash flows. And I think in some senses, the difference between how investors reconcile net income to free cash flows versus the current statement of cash flows reconciles net income to the change in cash in some sense. And I think that that kind of comparison is useful when we think about how users derive free cash flows. I don't know if, Christine, you want you have anything you'd like to add to that? Okay, so um, we'll move on to the next question then. So has the board of staff received any feedback from creditors about the elements of the statement of cash flows they find most useful? Well, I think in credit, you know, we have talked to many people and I think overall, maybe this message is, you know, the the from feedback that we've heard from investors in general is that the statement of cash flows is useful. It does provide useful information about the cash movements, even the indirect, you know, there's been some criticism of the indirect uh, indirect method, for example, but for, for many, for, for most all entity types, the, the cash flow statement does provide useful information about changes in assets, cash movements, uh, working capital uh, in, in predicting future cash flows. However, there are these, um, the issues that we raised today are the ones that that investors and others have asked us to work on. So I think the the only areas where and the, and and it kind of leads to this current project that we have is that for financial institutions, many investors and preparers across the board have said that the cash flow statement um, does not necessarily provide decision useful information in all cases, and things are miscategorized, misclassified because the operations of a bank uh, is very different from that of a, of a non banking institution, for example. So, um, you know, I think we've heard um, that. Um, you know that they are that the the statement of cash flows does provide useful information, uh, but again, these are the areas that, that are pinpointed that we're trying to to fix. I'll and take then, the next next question. Oh, sorry, sorry Jeff, did I no, interrupt you? No, okay. Um, so the next question is: After addressing all the issues in this presentation, should we expect a very similar cash flow statement from the FASB and the ISB? Well. Um, both the FASB and the ISB are are have not neither of us have decided to put a project on our agenda that is um you know a, a bigger project on the cash flow statement we have those very limited that very limited technical agenda project um that uh, was discussed earlier, but on our research agenda, that's the consideration of whether we should be doing more, and if so, what that would look like. And uh, my understanding is that the ISB is also in a similar uh, point in deciding what, if anything, they should do and what that project would look like. So I think uh, we would first have to get to a point where both the FASB and the ISB decided to put projects on our agenda and then it'll you know depend on what the scope of those projects look like but what i can say is that um when you know whenever we're working on projects uh we are keeping very informed of what the other uh party is doing and so um you know we we would certainly be aware of what the isb is doing they would be aware of what we were doing and uh we we try to ensure that we don't end up with differences for differences sake we we um you know, we do end up with differences sometimes, but um, only when when the boards um, in looking at their own decisions come to the conclusion that from a cost benefit uh, perspective in their jurisdiction, uh, what what they're proposing is is a better solution. So I guess all I can really say is stay tuned on that one. Okay, thank you, Christine. And so we have time for one more question, and then we'll have to have to conclude. So uh, we have the question is: When companies say that it's very costly to prepare the statement of cash flows using the direct method, what specific costs do they mean? If you think a statement of cash flows as cash based accounting, wouldn't it be to pull all cash journal entries and report them? So yes, so that that is the question. I could speak to this probably because I have a preparer background, and I worked for a multinational that operated in seventy five plus countries. And I think what you have here is that. 
it's a systems issue mainly. So if you uh, if you're going to develop a system, you have to have a system in place that would be able to tag all journal entries at the cache at the journal entry level in order to do and also consider all the FX implications to develop a standard of cache flows under the direct method. So I think that that the systems for many companies are just are just not in place. They don't exist, and this would be extremely costly to implement. So I think you know we looked at and I think part of our research has been involved in looking at are there other ways than just sort of going down to that super granular level in, in developing the standard of cash flows? Are there other methods that are developed? And, and for example, we know that when companies produce um, um, disclose cash tax, cash interest paid, for example, they're using what, you know, sort of the indirect direct method. They're taking the change in the, the income statement. They're taking the income statement plus or minus changes in the balance sheet and sort of um, roughly calculating, or I don't want to say roughly calculating, but um, calculating that that sort of direct direct cash flow using an indirect calculation method. And we're looking at uh, opportunities to see if that would also be something that would be operational for, for many different types of companies. But yes, I think that's, you know, just try to give you a flavor of, you know, maybe for the smaller, a smaller organization tagging the individual journal entries might not be difficult, but from what we've heard, it could be very difficult at, at a large, corp, large, large multinational level. So um, I think Christine and Michael, you were going to um, uh, wrap up. Sounds good. Michael, you want to take yep. it away, Mike? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, thanks, everybody, for, for joining us today. Um, I know from having received the papers on the Intangibles Conference coming up that um, we received uh, a, a number of great papers. We received quite a few uh, great papers that are very interesting and look forward to this really important topic. I mean, again, um, when we started thinking about topics, I was super excited um, uh, to think about this one because I don't think the statement of cash flows gets nearly as much attention as it possibly could. And um, I think today we've talked about a number of issues. Just think about this very last one about the the costs, potential costs and research into generating costs or, or thinking about the costs of different methods. Um, uh, I think a lot of topics have been brought up today that I think are super interesting. So I'm looking forward to, to reading papers and, and I'll toss it over to you to Chris, Christine. Yes, and I'd just like to add my thanks to um, those that were just expressed. Um, your research is really important to what we do at the board, and uh, we we try to do what we can um, to uh, support that. If you ever have any suggestions for things that we can do um, in addition to the activities that, that we um, are doing um, or ways that we could improve, please feel free to share those with us. And uh, we look forward to some great cash flow papers. So keep us in mind. Um, and if there's anything that we can help uh, with as you uh, progress through your research journey, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Have a great day. And I hope everybody has an enjoyable weekend. Thank you. Bye.